All right, my name is Jonathan Swain, John Swain I usually call myself, and um, I make uh, bagpipes, flutes and whistles, and I've been doing that for about 30 years. Oh, and how, how did you first get into that then? Well, it's a long story, but um, when I left school I trained as a lawyer. I did a university degree in law and um, then professional examinations in law, became a solicitor, uh, and um, after a while I decided that I didn't want to do it for the rest of my life. It took me about 12 years to get out of it. Well, not that I was trying for 12 years to get out of it, but um, at the end of 12 years I finally succeeded in finding something else. I was um, playing music, uh, flute and piano, mainly flute, uh, in various local orchestras and groups um, uh, and um, it so much that it became like a semi-professional thing and uh, then I met some people who were playing early music if that means anything to you um, it's a technical term but really for you know for uh, music that's not modern, I mean um, Renaissance, Baroque, uh, Medieval, all that stuff. And uh, there was a demand at that time, still is of course, for um, instruments to play that music on. And uh, because they're not being made anymore, and a lot of them don't survive. And if there were any surviving, there certainly wouldn't be enough to go around to satisfy the numbers of people who want to play them. Uh, of course, um, we all know recorders, uh, and um, Arnold Dolmetsch started the recorder revival in the 1930s. Um, but um, you know there are many other early instruments like um, flutes and crumb horns and so on. And um, uh, as I say, I met some people who were playing early music, and I became aware that there was a demand for <coughs> instruments to play that kind of music on and uh, uh, at the same time I was working for um, some people who were starting a crafts community centre. I did a wood turning course there and sort of putting two and two together I thought oh, maybe I could make woodwind instruments and um, I tried to get an apprenticeship without any success but I, in the course of doing that I found out about a full-time instrument technology course in London that was running uh, and managed to get myself onto it. Oh. So I did a three-year full-time course in instrument making uh, directed at early woodwind technology um, making Renaissance recorders, Baroque flutes, all sorts. And uh, uh, in the course of the first year, uh, I met some people who were playing folk music, uh, and um, well, at the end of that year, I decided that probably folk music was more interesting for me than um, early music, and although I kept making um, early woodwinds for quite a few years, um, I started making folk whistles and flutes and bagpipes uh, towards the end of the first year on that course and um, over the years I began to specialise in that and the um, the other instruments which I made like Renaissance recorders and flutes they all and start, I stopped making them in the end. Um, another thing which happened was very important during the first year was that I met some people, oh I think I've already said that, playing folk music um, but I started playing it myself, which I'd never done before. And uh, we started a band which um, became Blosabella and um, uh, became very successful and has been very, um, being very influential on contemporary folk music in, in Europe and the world. So, so from what I understand, you've kind of, you've, you've moved, you've gone from like the whole legal thing and got out of that and you've ended up... Uh on the music side, you, you gig, you compose, and yeah. you make instruments. Yeah. So you've got kind of like the, the full three there. Did, did you enjoy gigging with uh, Blazabella? I still do. Oh, right. Uh, we're still going. Oh, cool. Um, I did. We we were um, more or less a full-time band uh, in the late 80s. Uh, 
I had to leave the band for a few years um, for family reasons and family commitments and so on. I rejoined in 1990, um, but by that time uh, the, some of the others were getting a bit fed up with the pressure of touring and uh, had, you know, beginning families and things, and so we decided to uh, stop the band in 1990. Um, about five years after that, a few of us got together just to do occasional gigs. And then in 2003, we realized that it would be the 25th anniversary. So we had a big get together to celebrate that, all the next members and so on, um, and the people who'd been in it in 1990. Uh, and that went very well. And we decided to carry on with the same kind of lineup that had been going in 1990, um, and uh, seven seven musicians, and there've been a couple of changes since then. But um, everybody's very enthusiastic, and we do sort of between I don't know um, eight and twelve gigs a year, not a huge number, because we're all very involved in other things. Um, uh, we've all got our own projects and so on, and um, Everybody's very busy, uh, so it's quite hard to get together, but we like to do it, and um, so yeah, it's it's very. Um, we're still writing ninety percent of, probably more than ninety percent of our own repertoire, and um, yeah. And what, what's kind of, in terms of like the folk world? What's like the best gig that you've ever done with Place Pella? Oh well, probably. I would say, without a doubt, um, doing the uh, last night bal at Saint Chartier. I can't remember exactly the year. It was. It might have been uh, two thousand and. Well, it was a few years ago. Anyway, uh, but um, and it was. Uh, uh, are you familiar with that festival at all? No, I'm sure you are. Yeah. Okay, well, it's it's um, been very influential in my life um, as a bagpipe maker because it was set up in 1976. Uh, it was started in 1976 by a local hurdy gurdy enthusiast uh, in order to encourage the makers of bagpipes and hurdy gurdies in that area of that village which is in the geographical center of France where there's a very strong has been a very strong tradition of bagpipe and hurdy-gurdy playing um, which um, kind of began, began to die out in the 60s but was went underwent a very strong revival uh, and that festival had a lot to do with the revival um, we, I first went there in 1979, and I think I've been every year since, except for 1983, when Blosabella was playing at some festivals in Canada. Um, I say it's been a strong influence. It's introduced us to a huge um, repertoire of music. It's, it's set by meeting other makers, of which there are probably, you know, maybe a hundred plus now. By me, me uh, Meeting other makers, it's raised standards uh, of the standards of instrument making, and it's been it's set me, you know, a goal uh, to make better instruments, um, and uh, of course it's enabled me to reach a much wider uh, public for selling instruments. Uh, the, you can never tell quite how well you're going to do there in terms of sales because um, every year is different. But there have been years in which I've got maybe, you know, six months' work. So it's been very valuable for my working life since I started instrument making. Anyway, um, the concert uh, program is always is fairly fairly interesting. They they find performers from all over Europe and all over the world. Um, mostly with a, a bagpipe or hurdy-gurdy um, content, but not necessarily. They once had um, Joan Byers, which I thought was a strange choice. What's um, that one? She's a South American singer who was who had some hits in the 60s and has continued a, quite a strong career. 
as a sort of um, contemporary folk singer. Uh, anyway, I discovered that she was um, it was it, that she was much beloved by the festival organizer and had been a dream of the organizers to get her there. Oh, right. So even though she didn't really have much to do with the festival, she performed. Um, but normally they have, uh, 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 you know, pretty strong, very strong, the, the, the best um, groups you can hear in the field there headlining the concerts. Um, and uh, in more recent times they've been putting on um, big dances and things and uh, they asked us to play there a few years ago and we had a huge, huge, huge audience um, uh, it nearly didn't happen because of the weather. It was a very thundery day, very very hot, um, and um, we had a we had a um, sound check before the gig, and uh, a bulldozer came on and started digging up the dance floor, which we couldn't understand. But it was that there was you know the health and safety issues are affecting France as strongly as they're affecting here, and they were. They took up the dance floor and just let uh, let people dance on um, on bare earth because they thought it was safer than people falling off the dance floor, <laughs> which was a bit odd. But anyway, it, the gig went uh, fantastically well, and I would say that's probably my my strongest um, strongest memory. There've been lots of other ones as well. And also, you were talking about the uh, hundred plus bagpipe makers. Um... Yeah, well, not bagpipe makers, but um, all kinds of folk instruments, but. Uh, possibly thirty or forty bagpipe makers. In terms of that, where would you sort of uh, where do you see yourself ranked in terms of uh, bagpipe ma in the bagpipe making community as well as attached to making bagpipes? Um, well, I guess that in in that kind of world, uh, in taking that festival. Um, uh, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as a kind of standard and um, uh, the kind of people who would exhibit there I, I, I don't know, I mean I might be in the top sort of five or something like that I guess, yeah but um, the thing is that um, you know, you have to regard this kind of bagpipe as completely separate from say Highland Pipes you know, Highland Pipes have been uh, no one knows quite where the first Highland pipe was made, um, it 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 uh, benefits from, or if that's the right word, a very long tradition. Um, the the Highland pipes as we know them were probably made somewhere around two hundred years ago or, or less, but the instrument itself has been going for much longer than that, and um, because of the fact that it was banned by the British as an instrument of war at one time before the Act of Union and then when uh, Scotland and England came together under the same monarch um, the army uh, took the bagpipe under its wing and you know everything that is um, adopted by the army has to be standardised so they're all the same which meant that um, uh, Highland a Highland bagpipe is more or less a standard instrument now and you can go out and buy a reed for one and know that it'll it'll work in your instrument. That's not the case with these and you know with bagpipes that don't have a strong tradition. The 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 instruments I mainly make are what I call what we call border pipes, which are um instruments derived from instruments which were played uh in the borders, that's to say, you know, the border between England and Scotland. Uh, in the lowlands of Scotland, not the highlands, uh, and in the north of England. And they were popular um, from this, <clears throat> as far as we know, from the 17th century up to the early 19th century, and then they dropped out of favour because other more useful instruments came along, like the fiddle and the accordion and so on. And uh, that happened, that story is typical of many European bagpipes. Um, bagpipes were known all over Europe and beyond. Um, and you can find bagpipes in northern India, and in the uh, in in Georgia, um, Siberia, and Ukraine, and you know most of um, the 
Europe and, and the countries near to it had bagpipes, and North Africa as well. They're thought to have originated somewhere in the Middle East and were possibly, uh, uh, possibly um, uh, caused to travel by the Crusaders like many other um, uh, musical instruments. Um, I can't remember what I, why I started talking about this. Now you asked me a question and I got off on, nice, on a, right. a bit oh, of a, quite bit of a tangent. The, how, because um, you're talking about the standardised army yeah. like bagpipes. Yeah. Is there anything that makes your uh, the John Swain bagpipe kind of unique or anything that you've designed differently? Uh, yes, I remember models? what I was going to say now is that, okay. um, is that uh, uh, the first bagpipe I made was based on um, a picture of a Flemish instrument from about 1550. And you probably know the pictures that I'm thinking of, the ones by Bruegel. Uh, there's, there are two or three famous ones um, showing bagpipes in great detail. There's one of a peasant wedding and another of a peasant dance. And uh, I'd seen various Flemish pipes. When I made the decision to make the first set of pipes, I'd seen various sort of so-called Flemish pipes, but I hadn't seen any that looked exactly like that. And I thought it would be very interesting to study the painting very closely and make a, as close a copy as I could. Of course, you can't tell much about the acoustics by looking at the instrument. You can tell something about it, but not, um, not much. So I had to make up a, a lot of it. But you can make very educated guesses about the way the instrument could have sounded. Um, and then I made a, a similar period bagpipe but based on pictures of English pipes at, from that same time and then after a year or two a few years I began to think of well what about the surviving English pipes and uh, I heard about border pipes and started researching them a bit uh, at, at the same time I'd started going to Saint Chartier and I'd heard the results of what people were making in in the field, not necessarily border pipes, but the pipes from central France and um, from Belgium. <clears throat> and uh, I thought what I would like to do would be to make an instrument that is based on the format of the border pipe, but with a performance that is geared towards playing music from the south of England and from uh, Europe. Um, the border pipe repertoire is a little bit more limited than that in the sense that uh, it uses a narrower scale and fewer chromatic notes. Um, uh, my instruments will play that repertoire as well, but it will also play a much wider repertoire because it has a slightly wider range. Um, and more flexibility. Um, it's also at a slightly lower pitch than the average border pipe, which, um, uh, and uh, mainly because um, it's easier to play with the instruments that are already being played for folk music in the southern part of England, like accordions and so on. And then the kind of people who buy bagpipes is there, because obviously it's quite. Um a different instrument to like let's say guitars or drums or something more yeah. kind of pop music yeah. um is there a, cer a certain kind of person who's into making bagpipes for instance does it take a certain kind of personality i don't know about making i think that um <clears throat> there's something about the well i suppose you know the main characteristic of a bagpipe is the fact that the sound is continuous and it has its own accompaniment built in in the form of the drone or the drones. So you've got a, a continuous note with a melody on top of it. Um, and many people, well, it's a bit like Marmite. Some people like it and some don't. Um, and it, the, the opinion tends to be quite polarised. You either like it a lot or you hate it, I think, sometimes. Uh, partly it's because quite often you hear bagpipes being very badly played. Um, 
but um, uh, there's been a lot of interest in bagpipes in, in recent years, in my experience, and I've been fortunate enough to um, make a living at it. Um, but it's it, but it's been a question partly of creating my own market. Um, when I first left the instrument making college, I had one or two orders, and those orders had come uh, for bagpipes. That is, those orders had come because people had heard me playing the pipes that I made, uh, you know, in the street or whatever, and said, "Where did you get them?" And I said, "Well, I made them. Can you make some for me?" And so on. And um, most of the work I get comes from word of mouth. It, you know, it took uh, quite a while to become established, but, um, but, uh, yeah. No, and also um, with composing, because yeah. that's a whole other uh, kind of area to specify, like be a specialist in. Um, how do you, in terms of composing your own material, is it, does that get played with Bozabella or? It does get played with blows, but yes, I I don't know um, how many tunes I've written, but um, uh, it's a very satisfying thing to do to um, to write a tune and have it performed, uh, and then maybe people f to hear it and start playing it themselves and so on. Um, but uh, in um, the early nineties, I started a trio of bagpipes using two different pitches, two bagpipes in G and one in C. So it's a bit like a, if you like, a string quartet, to use a, a similar anal uh, an analogy. Um, because I was very intrigued by the idea of playing, uh, of making arrangements of music for, uh, harmonized arrangements of, of music for pipes. Because traditionally it's a solo instrument and um, in some parts of the world, it's still a shepherd's instrument. You know, be, the shepherd would be off with his flocks all day with nothing much to do, and playing a musical instrument is um, a way of keeping yourself um, from getting terribly bored. Uh, and animals like the sound of it very often. Um, so pipes have a certain association with uh, with with, um, with shepherds um, and uh, for that reason it was thought of as a solo instrument and still is in many cases um, in the Highland bagpipe world they have bagpipe bands but the the kind of highest honours go to the soloists um, uh, so uh, yeah I had this idea of and it I wasn't certainly wasn't alone. I, I had a lot of inspiration from other people who were trying it out, um, writing music for um, s s two or three or more pipes um, using harmony. Um, so you would have a separate line maybe for each each instrument. Um, and I started a trio, as I said, called Merbius, which um, started in the early nineties, and I wrote uh, a lot of material for that. Um, uh, you know enough for a CD and more, uh, uh, and and uh, we performed a lot. Um, it, we haven't performed for a few years now, but um, the music still gets played occasionally in other groupings. And then, uh, uh, towards the end of the nineties, I started another bagpipe group called Zephyrus, which is six bagpipes and percussion. And uh, again, it was a question of writing all the repertoire for it. And I've written um, well two CDs worth of repertoire for that. So um, yeah, I mean, there's been um, uh, I enjoy writing. I find it very hard work, um, um, very um, very demanding. But if if I can persuade myself to get down to it, it usually produces worthwhile results. Yeah, and so what's a typical day then as a freelance composer, bagpipe maker, and well, most of my time is spent in the workshop because that's where my income comes from. You know, there's not much money. I haven't... I do get a trickle of income from performing rights, you know, for music that I've written. Uh, but it's not massive and I certainly couldn't live on it. Um, so most of my 
<coughs> working day is spent in the workshop making instruments. And, um, you know, I've got an assistant who does three days a week and he's been doing that for over ten years now. And Before that I had various other colleagues working for me. So um, I've been very f fortunate in having um, uh, a full order book uh, the whole time I've been making instruments. Um, I think that the present economic climate has affected things slightly, but I've still got um, at least two years' work in hand. So if somebody orders an instrument today, they won't get it for two years. And that's I should qualify that by saying that I um, make a, a beginner's bagpipe, or which I call a student bagpipe, um, if somebody's starting, they want to start now, so that is available always within six months. And um, I also make flutes and whistles, and I usually make batches of whistles once a well, within two or, two or three months at the beginning of the year. Uh, and um, <clears throat> they may be in stock or they may not, but but usually I have whistles available. I'm, mm, yeah. So, but apart, but f as far as bagpipes are concerned, the main. Uh, uh, the main output, um, yeah, you have you'd have to wait t at least two years. Yeah, but in terms of how you feel about it, from not being happy at a, a law school to now fully doing it and being two years in demand, uh, how does that feel for you? I'm very content doing what I do. I love it. Yes, and uh, I mean I'm six years past retiring age. Uh, I, I'm 71 this year and um, I don't envisage giving up any time soon um, because I like it. Um, I don't have a pension, that's part of the reason why I keep going. But but um, aside from that, um, I like doing it and uh, I get a lot of satisfaction from it. And uh, I feel very lucky to be able to do it. Um, uh, I've met, you know, i made friends all over the world. Um, and uh, sometimes they come here to buy instruments and sometimes I go and visit them. Um, uh, yeah. That's cool. And also, do you find, um, even though that you're past retiring, um, that you're still kind of learning as you go? Definitely, yes. Yeah, we learn all the time. And the pipes are still developing then? They are, yeah, yeah. And... Uh, um, well, I'm making for the first. Uh, I'm making uh, right now. I'm working on a set of pipes, which is the first uh, example of that type that I'm selling that I've sold. It's called a pastoral bagpipe, and um, it was invented in England probably uh, in about eighteen hundred or uh, no. Uh, sorry, 1700, somewhere around 1700. Uh, it was invented to fulfill a demand amongst um, well-off amateur musicians, men, I would say, who wanted to play a rustic instrument and a bagpipe was, bagpipe was thought of as a rustic instrument. Um, there was a fashion for um, for going back to nature, uh, which was very strong in Europe, um, and this instrument seems to have been made to fulfil that that uh, that urge to play to play a rustic instrument. Um, <clears throat> it had quite an advanced specification compared with other bagpipes. It was quieter, had a wider range, um, and uh, was played with bellows rather than being mouth blown. Uh, and it was supposed to be able to play uh, the same sort of range as a flute. Um, a lot of them were made uh, during the 18th century and they survive in museums. There was a tutor written for them in 1750 or a bit earlier, which um, was published in several editions. 
uh, so there's obviously a demand for it. Um, the puzzle is now that we don't haven't really known how to make that instrument work satisfactorily, and I've spent um, more than fifteen years working on it as time allows. Um, and I finally got to the point uh, where I now think I've got a reasonably um, playable instrument. So this is a copy uh, of a, an instrument in a museum. It's in the Brussels Conservatoire Museum, although there are plenty in England as well, but I just happened to have chosen this example um, uh, because it's, a, it, it's typical of its kind and it's made by well-known maker of pastoral pipes, Hugh Robertson, who worked in Edinburgh in about 1770. Uh, and um, so, I'm, as I say, I'm just making, completing the first example of this that I'm selling. Uh, so that would be something, you know, new to the workshop, if you like, uh, in the, as far as sales are concerned, although I've been working on it for some time. And there are other things that I want to make that I haven't made yet. So there's um, yeah, there's plenty of development. Sounds uh, quite pioneering. Well, it is in a way. Um, one or two people have had a go at making this instrument um, without, I dare say, um, a great deal of success. Um, I think I've got somewhere with it, so we'll see. And um, finally, because we've run out of time now, uh, is, could you introduce uh, one of your own songs and and uh, play, as, play as one of yours? Okay. Could you introduce what it is first as well? Then? Okay. Um, this is... Uh, this bagpipe is typical of the ones that I make. It's a border pipe in G. It has three drones in octaves and uh, it's bellows blown. Um, and... Uh, well, I'll play um, I'll play a jig which I wrote some years ago called Pender's Fen. It was actually inspired by a, a TV film, um, and I've forgotten the name. For a long time, I thought it was by Dennis Potter, but it's not by Dennis Potter. It's by somebody else, and it told the story of a slightly disturbed adolescent who was living in 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 the Malverns, and near where Elgar lived, and he meets uh, the ghost of King Pender and the ghost of Elgar, and uh, he sits playing excerpts from Elgar's dream, Grotis, on the church organ in the local church, and he reaches a, the climactic point of the work, and as he does so, the floor of the nave splits from end to end. It's a, it's a fantastic film. 